uh, on a very special occasion at the 10th anniversary of JLF. I've got Namita Gokhale, one of the three co-founders of the JLF on my left, and her cousin, the distinguished writer, Rinald Pandey on my right. And the reason this is a very special moment is because it marks the third and final of Namita's brilliant Himalayan trilogy, Things to Leave Behind. As you can see, we've been blessed with these special gilded sachets, and all three of Namita's books, uh, the new one, of course, has a brilliant jacket, but the older two of, of the Himalayan tragedy, uh, uh, Himalayan trilogy, have just come out with brilliant new covers rejacketed. Uh. A Himalayan love story, which was published 24 years ago, is the first of the three. And here is one of my favorite books, The Book of Shadows, published in 1999. It's a ghost story told by a ghost. And this is the latest. Things to leave behind. This has just come out and has been much celebrated. Please give Namita Gokhale a very, very big hand for a remarkable piece of work written over 24 years. Thank you. The session is, is eponymously called Things to Leave Behind after Namita's latest book. But I think it'll be much more fun to re-Christian it, so I'm going to call it The Kissing Cousins of Kumau. परसों मैंने शाम को मैंने नमिता से पूछा कि नमिता मुझे बताओ कि आपका क्या रिश्ता है मेरे नाल पांडे से These two great literary ladies who everybody is so well acquainted with तो नमिता कहने लगी एक ही नहीं we are related in three or four ways and by the time she uh, embarked upon this elaborate story of kinship between these uh, two women, I said, Ye kamal hai. This must be one of the great small incestuous uh, communities of India in landlocked Kamau where everybody is repeatedly interrelated and not just recently but over many generations. So, Namita, what is the first thing that I've known Rinal since I was born, clearly. <laughs> and um, it's, it's just too complicated to explain, but we, have, uh, we are both from Kumau. We are both Kumauni Brahmins. And um, all Kumauni Brahmins who are Pants, Pandes, and Joshis are related to each other, and they have the same surnames. They also have the first names. They're all Hemas, Harishas, Jeevans. So it is impossible to make out about anybody. But uh, her mother was related to me from my father's side. They were from the same um, Jeevanpur um, area. And then I was also related to her from her father's side. And I'm sure there are many other ways. But the way I like to feel related to her is to be associated with her great mother. Her mother was one of the finest, greatest, and also most popular writers the Hindi world has ever known, the one and only Shivani ji. So now you know where the great literary genes come from. Uh, they don't just come through kinship and marriage and connection uh, through rishtas, but they also come through a life of the mind. Uh, Mrinal, what are your first memories of Namita Gokhale, one of your many, many cousins? Why is she special? I mean, why are you on stage with her? Well, uh, she's special primarily because she's intelligent. I cannot stand duffers, neither could my mother. 
and she made it very clear, you know, occasionally when people were visiting, she'd sit with a long face or make some snap comment or abruptly get up and leave. Or when they were leaving, even before they turned down the staircase, she'd bang the door on them. <laughs> and we'd say, Ditu, itni batamizi se kyu pesh aati hai? She'd turn around leg regally and say, I do not suffer fools gladly and neither should my daughters. So, <laughs> ye streak jo hai, ye ek tarah se jivan pur ka streak hai, which the ancestry we share in common. We are both brusk, we are both short-tempered, but we are also both very affectionate people underneath, as all <laughs> short-tempered people like to believe. And uh, she's special to me always. My mother was inordinately fond of her grandmother, also her mother. And her father was a cousin um, on my mother's side. And uh, she was just very fond of the family because they were a family of book lovers. They read copiously. And we grew up in Nainital where her grandmother had a beautiful cottage. And it was on the way to our school. So whenever there was sudden rain, which was very often in Nainital, we were free to go to their house, demand a change of clothes, have some hot snacks, and wait till someone from home came with our gumboots and our <laughs> Macintoshes. So um, I, I've always placed a special um, place, kept a special place for her in my heart. I've, my first memory of her is when she was born. She was born in the Dufferin Hospital in Lucknow, and her mother, uh, being such a special niece, my mother said, Chalo, Uska cookie ki beti hui hai, hum dekh ke aate hai. So trot, trot, trot. My, I'm, in those days, parents thought of nothing carrying, taking young children into hospitals. There was no talk of germs or anything. I mean, a new baby has come in the family. So all four of her siblings must welcome the baby. So there my mother and <laughs> mother dug waddling around with four of us. And then she went there and her grandmother said, Shivani, tum iski jeep par um, yeah, shahed rakho. So my mother Shivani put the Saraswati Shahed on her tongue. That I remember clearly. The rest is a dim memory. Well, now you know, how Namita Vidwan was made. Namita. No, I mean, it is something. What is your memory of no, this? No, first I have to say that what a blessing to have a writer like Shivani putting honey on my tongue and can you imagine what a horribly spoken person I would have been even without that honey I am not a very well soft spoken person even though my name is Namita which means Jeevan polite. Jeevanpur jeans. Jeevanpur jeans my dear. And I just wanted to say that since this is very much a nostalgia session just as my books look back in Kumau this sari that I'm wearing today is a sari which belonged to Shivani ji which Minal very kindly gave me some time ago so we are linked in so many memories of textures of 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 smells of so many layers of memory and one thing I will say for the Jivanpur clan was that it was usually intermarried and it took things for granted, you know, in the sense that children's property was parental property, no questions asked. And it was supposed to be extremely rude to ask your parent what happened to the stuff that you, <laughs> that was in your room, which you had ostensibly kept for personal use. So about Jivanpur, it was said that the children were so disciplined that whenever a daughter-in-law came into the family, she brought her, you know, big stash of pots and pans and clothes and stuff from her mother's house. And when the next daughter in the Jivanpur clan got married, this was given to her as her dowry because, you know, parents were uniformly poor. So there was one instance in which some parent had, out of affection, got all the pots inscribed in, her in their daughter and the son-in-law's name. And they were given by the Jiv somebody in Jivanpur to another clan. And two generations later, somebody from that clan married into Jivanpur and came back with those inscribed pots and pan. So it became a story that Jivanpur was the best Jivanpur. That's that's the kind of internetedness that, that is there. It's all. Question of my first memory. My first memories were in our living room in Primrose in Nenital. The fog is coming in. Her mother is sitting there. The fog used to, in, still does in Nenital, 
literally from the windows enter the inside of the room. There's very, the hola when it comes, there's no distinction between outside and... And there is her mother sitting there and there are the two sisters sitting there. And every time her mother came out with a new book, there would be fear and consternation in my family. Because she would pick her characters from across uh, the small community. And then they would read the book. And I think they would be slightly disappointed if it wasn't about them. Just like they would be outraged if it was about them. So there would be this huge guessing game. And she wrote 52 novels, I think. Uh, novels and collections of short stories. No, short so stories? between 52 novels and collections of short stories. And not to speak of journalism. So between them, every time they came out, there would be this thing. Who is she writing about now? Family secrets. The great thing, I mean, the late and great Shivani, a profound influence in, in Hindi, the life of Hindi letters and literature, remarkable woman with wonderful taste, an inherited sari, khane banane may be bohot mahati, great, great woman, lived in Lucknow, a woman who lived on her own terms and through very difficult times, earning a living through her writings. Am I right, Minal? Yes, perfectly. In fact, we were, we, children accept a lot of things. We were brought up in a house where the mother always wrote and earned a side income. My government was, my father was a middle level government functionary and there was just enough money to keep this little family in the hills going. And we also at any given point in time had several of our cousins staying with us going to schools with us because Nanital had good schools. So my mother was forever writing and when winter came and we needed winter uniforms, two months before the winter session started, we would inform our mother, Tum naya upanyas likhna shuru kar do, Dharmveer Bharti ji ko aur Manohar Shyam Joshi ko likh do, ki tum naya upanyas shuru kar rahi ho, humari winter uniforms banwane hai. So against those proposed serialized novels to be serialized in Dharmi Yuga and Saptahik Hindustan, advances were sought, then we would trot off to Ramlal and Sons, get ourselves measured by the common tailor Hari Chand, and then have our... Uh, log Besharmi said we used to milch our mother for money whenever we needed anything. And uh, my mother used to say ki main Leela Pawar ki tarah din raat baiht ke petticoat silti rehti. <laughs> Lalita Pavar ki tarah se roti hi petticoat silti rehti hu ki mere bachyo ki uniform ban jai but it was a big joke. So like the crutchets we made a big joke of our poverty and our straightened circumstances and our mother taught us to laugh at this. We could have been sunk in existential angst at that point about a woman keeping the family afloat or, you know, my mother being overworked or whatever. But she was the first to joke about it and made us see how creativity gives, gave her so much pleasure that everything else became worthwhile. You know, in case you think that this uh, Kumauni clan Connected and reconnected and interconnected is a very powerful and wealthy community. It's not. Uh, the way the stories unfold in the many books these two cousins have written together is a saga of very formidable women. And they all unfold over a century like a feminist plot or several feminist plots. Uh, we've spoken evocatively about Shivani, and I want to contribute a small, tiny memory of Nirja Pant, uh, whose 80th birthday we just celebrated. Yes, Auntie Nirja, cookie auntie, hand up. Hey. My mother uh, is sitting there. She drove down to, from Delhi this morning just to be here. She's just published a book recently, The Great Nirja Pant, but as a small boy, I remember. Uh, my parents and the Pant family were great friends. What an amazing woman, a woman blessed with a prodigious memory. 300,000 verses in her head. Koi asa nahi tha, shair ja kavi, and always came out with a couplet which was so apposite and appropriate. She was wickedly naughty and in those stuffy government circles came like a breath of fresh air. 
when everybody said acha neeja ji kahan jaati hain aap saturday sunday ko hum to sab ladies taash khelti hain main to races khelti hu so highly individual characters thoda things to leave behind me se ek sunao namita that tells us the story of these women uh, i wanted you in the beginning i'm going to read uh, the novel begins it's uh, it's set between 1840 and 1912 just a little patch of time and it begins in 18 in, in 1856 just before the fateful year of the indian mutiny a curious phenomenon was observed in the fledgling hill station of nainital six native women draped in black and scarlet pichoras circled the lake for 3 days singing mournful songs which no one could understand as they used the lower road reserved for dogs and indians the british sahib log chose to ignore their antics the pahadi community however was thrown into a panic the hill people knew as the british did not that it was the inauspicious month of the shardas when the spirits of the dead and gone hover over the lake in the late autumn evenings scarlet and black were colors sacred to the death cults and the goddess kali these women could only be dakinis evil female spirits with some dark accursed purpose but they said nothing not even to each other they hid their apprehensions behind stern looks and a tight lip silence for sometimes to recognize an evil is to give it more force i won't read much more maybe another passage later right but it's to give you a sense of you know the in in kumau the goddesses are very powerful but the demonesses are as powerful both the demons and the demonesses and the dakinis and the yakinis are very much a part of our uh, mythological understanding of ourselves as well it's a powerful historical novel set in kumau but it also as i said opens with so many elements of the female principle both living and past mrinal pande you've extensively written about the power of the devis in your book on the devis that the influence the daily rituals the tradition how they really control the life material and domestic of every kamauni household bataiye kuch jab pad ke sunaiye devi mein se devi to mere paas nahi hai abhi but i'll i'll uh, i'll just talk a little about the goddesses Uh, you see basically i think in times past the society was a tribal matriarchal society it was only later when our brahmin ancestors moved in some from konkan some from saryopar some from bengal some from gujarat and people did that some kind of brahminical ethos was superimposed but it was observed more in flouting by the women the men of course because brahmanism gave them power and authority of a kind uh, native region religion would not clung to their brahmin identities the women did not and in this they were greatly helped by the devis many of whom they inherited from the people who lived in the area so we had things like um in 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 uh, namita's novel there is uh, pashan devi the, the goddess of the stone It, this is just a projecting stone on the side of the nani lake which is where the lake is probably very deep and many people who are suicidal usually ritually go and drown uh, drown themselves in it and every every year people just sigh and say devi ne ek aur bali le li so life and death and prosperity and despair everything can be traceable to some devi or another there are devis who give grant you a fertile womb there are devis who can kill the child in your womb there are devis who grant you wisdom there are devis who put a fog over your head and make you go wayward and all these devis eat and drink and they eat flesh so flesh and wine is offered to them ritualistically because a lot of the yogis and nanats in 12th 13th centuries also came to the himalayas they brought with them the yogi nath culture so actually the culture that obtains is a hybrid of the aryan religions the nag religions the kinnar religion the gandharvas who trace their roots to the hills so all kinds of religion this is a little respect respectable Uh, respectable <laughs> where 
all the religions came and got trapped. Then the rest of the world moved on, but they kept mutating among themselves like the Jeevanpur clan, you know, and people kept on getting more and more eccentric, particularly women. I remember periodically one would hear ki, Are falani ke ghar mein unki chachi ke upar devi aai hui hai. And we would all go to see the spectacle of the woman with the devi. And this woman would be in a state of being possessed and her hair would be open and she would be shaking her head. Usually the devi ended up by slapping the mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> Very convenient. Which, and everybody said, Nani, Devi hai, Devi hai. So, as a child, I, I remember once when we had seen such a spectacle and we were going home, I asked my mother, Ki, Kya usne apni saas ko thappar lagane ke liye Devi chadhai thi? So my mother was quite outraged. She said, Devi koi chadhata thodi hai, chadha jati hai. So I said, Achha. The next time I was being very wicked, which I usually was, and wicked and destructive, my mother said, Aaj is par bhadra chadhi hui hai. So I said, Mene chadha rakhi hai. <laughs> so, I think women are powerful because they are left to do so many things. You know, they are in charge of everything and yet formally they are recognized as nothing. At a very young age, if you read the book, you will find how a very young girl will be just picked up by the family for getting married without so much as by your leave, get married to a man who may may not be suitable to her and then expected to develop a lifelong loyalty to him. And uh, no questions asked. But there was room in the margin for expressions of dissent when the girl came back to visit her own people. Then she would, then we would be ardent listeners at keyholes. Ki achha, wo kaki aai hui hai, wo, she's talking about being beaten by her husband. And then she would say, ki meri kutte jitni izzat nahi hai, one phrase that stuck in my mind. So I asked my mother at night, ki kutte jitni izzat kya hoti hai? She said, tusse kisne kaha? Tusse. So I said, tumhari kaki ke <laughs> I got one tight slap for that. So all this, uh, Namita has in a very poetic way recorded, but it is true, it was a part of our daily lives, this mention of goddesses, of the wicked and the good kind, and we were not to differentiate between them, because they were all equally worthy of our reverence, and when Jagar was called, you know, there is a ritual in which spirits of the dead are evoked if there is a problem, then they are supposed, the Jagariya is supposed to give you divine answers to your very physical problems. So when Jagar was called, the first to descend are these goddesses and demi-goddesses. And they come laughing and jumping and so the Jagariya starts doing all kinds of things which are unmentionable in, in sequence of women. But this is, he's showing the kind of devis that there are. Namita, going from the corporeal to the real, what were the rivalries between the women in this clan? Were there in uh, families some some are visible in things to leave behind. No, actually, to truthfully go back to my memories, I think there was much more a sense of sorority than rivalries. Of course, there were rivalries, but the real rivalries happened at a different economic level. Most people in Kumau were poor. Uh, I must say my grandparents and my family was relatively, uh, well, well they, they were privileged, if not well off. And my grandmother was quite a grand lady, but there was a constant sharing. Uh, I, I mean, it was not a consumerist rivalry. Yeah, there may be a rivalry if somebody is more beautiful or you wanted to marry somebody and somebody else was married. I mean, there were a lot of these uh, love rivalries because these were very passionate women and often they were married off without much sense of who they would be suitable for. In so, fact, there is a particular temple, a little temple to a demigoddess in Almora, which I don't know if it still exists, but it did exist when we were growing up and it was said that somebody was interested in marrying a very handsome young man who then got married or was married to somebody else. And this girl didn't give up lighting the lamp at that Devi's temple. And for 10 years, she lit the lamp till finally the first wife died and she married this man. So she was known as the temple wali kaki. <laughs> With passion, you know. I mean, what I remember is that Kumauni women are not docile. And even that Kumauni gene where I encounter it now, uh, and, and so there was affection, uh, sorority, strength, loyalty, but um, a, a different sort of 
anger and eagerness and uh, very very difficult to put into words but, but it's this, there in my novel with this forbidding cast of women that that uh, come through in the books many books that both of you have written and i'm surrounded by two uh, formidable uh, kamanis where did men feature were they totally on the margins let me read a very interesting piece uh, uh, from namita's book this is about jayesh um, this is the generation first exposed to western culture civilization suits ties uh, jeb ghadi chhadi hadi which is a dog <laughs> and uh, they are torn between their love for tradition and their love for the new things the glamour of the new things that they perceive including the white legged mames who talk to men without the inhibition or without any sense of duty uh, unlike their own women so this is the guy jayesh who is uh, kind of a dhobi ka gutta na ghar ka na ghat ka jayesh read and reread the chain letter several times was it too late now a year later to pass it on was he never marked for unhappiness forever marked for unhappiness he was a rationalist and he would not submit to such fancies for it would he sense be the first step towards superstition and confused religious logic of his elders the jumble of obscure rules by which his uncle and father lived out their lives high born kumauni brahmans were steeped in orthodoxy obsessed with notions of purity impurity auspicious and inauspicious actions and the immediate and karmic consequences of religious sanctions he tore up the letter finally made up his mind he would return to bombay the big debate was whether he should leave the town he was born in and move to the big bad city of bombay inhabited by christians and jews and parsis and work among them for a salary i have decided to return to bombay jayesh told his uncle many things are happening in india i cannot sit in almoda and ignore the rest of the world i shall search for dealers sales outside for anand anardana churan which his uncle was manufacturing his uncle jeevan's mouth fell open in astonishment he reached for another jalebi in the box of sweet meats hidden under a pile of notebooks this this is a very <laughs> familiar terrain uh, a lot of our uncles hid jalebi and worse things behind piles of books and you know they were discovered and then dusted and then put back where they belonged and suitable books were placed in front i shall leave next week move to nainital with devki his wife i also intend to visit my father at devgarh during this trip he told his aunt and finally his wife of his decision leaving no scope for argument or reproach when i was young the same age as jayesh if i appeared before my father i trembled before i dared to speak to him the vaidya <laughs> jeevan uh, told his wife if at all my father were to question me i would stare at him in terror unable to answer i may as well have been talking to a lion and look how jayesh speaks to me in this simmering cauldron of jeevan pur jeans uh, <laughs> there must have been any number of eccentrics lunatics who were they men women children how did it pan out this gene pool uh, you know we were all very proud of this when i was growing up we constantly told everybody you know we are kumaunis and we have the second highest level of insanity and schizophrenia in kumau after the parsis so it was understood that the parsis could be but we never took it in a negative way we thought it showed a uh, extraordinary genius and uh, i must say they are strange uh, i mean i have to be very careful because i know that many of my relatives cousins uh, close ones they show up with a slightly strange streak and one never knows when it starts showing up and then uh, well it's downwards all the way or upwards or in any damn direction alcoholism yeah, uh, yeah alcoholism 
alcoholism was rampant, although, you know, like the jalebi box, it was always hidden. No, but alcoholism, of course, because as they say, kumau, uh, what is it? Suryast kumau must. But uh, the women drank, and I think the women drank with more courage and stomach for some reason than the men. To go back to the insanities, um, I remember the town, uh, when I was reading Manto, he writes about the partition, and uh, also Tamas by Bhishum Sahani, he was writing about the partition from this side. Both of them remark on a fact that suddenly a lot of lunatics appeared on the streets of the city. I think it marks a schism in the mind. You're pulled by two strong civilizations, two strong cultural impulses, and they affect every part of your life, every part of your being. Your language is taken away from you and replaced with a foreign tongue. So all of a sudden you feel, I remember one insane aunt who used to say, Mere muh mein do do jeeb hain. Mere muh mein do do jeeb hain. So, you know, I now think on it, maybe it was a metaphor for being bothered by speeches. And I remember there was another uncle, he built a huge library, he was a big bibliophile. This was the best library in Nainital, not Nainital, elsewhere, I won't name the place. Anyway, so uh, this, another aunt of mine was visiting and this uncle's mother was escorting her to the library. She said, ye mere bete ka puja ghar hai. Ye dekh kitni sari yahan par kitabay hai. Isme Queen Victoria ki likhi bhi kitabay bhi hai. Of course, she didn't know a word of English, but she knew Queen Victoria was somebody to be associated with uh, if you wanted to have pretensions wow. and being celebrated. And this other aunt said, Acha. She said, Ki agar tu ne kya English literature padha hai? She said, Nahi. She said, Tab to tu ne kuch nahi padha. <laughs> you know? So these are little mirror examples of what was happening to the society at the time which Namita is describing. I remember there were two brothers, they had, it was said ki inke khandan mein pagal pan hai. You know, in those days nobody knew or talked about genes and they said inke khandan mein pagal pan hai. Periodically they used to uljalul harkat karte the, but then in good days one was a school teacher, one was a lawyer. So once they both trotted up to my grandmother's house, it had a big gate and there was a letter mailbox at the entrance, which was a big thing in that small town. So they looked at each other and they said, Ki, Yar, almode mein itne bakas, Allah bakas, Mola bakas, letter bakas, hamari ghar mein bakas nahi, chalo le jate hain. So they were, they plucked out the letter box and carried it, uh, started carrying it and then the policemen hauled them up under some section of Tazirate Hind. Then one servant came running to my grandmother ki, are un dono bhaiyon par Tazirate Hind laga di gai hai. Phir another person was sent running to the policeman to say ki, ye bichare thori mental hai, inko chhod do. So they were released. It was a small town. But what was happening was people were beginning to feel the spiritual and mental stresses. Today we would say it was the angst or whatever. We were, you know, given that it was a normal part of family life and we were to treat them exactly as though they were sane, even if they were doing weird things like walking into our house with peacock feathers in their head and a ghanti hanging from their neck. They were okay, they were uncles. So you have to remember that uh, life in the hills was lonely. It sounds very easy here in uh, Jaipur, which has always been a cosmopolitan city, but there were even Nainital, but uh, Almora, but even the smaller villages. Uh, it, it was very cold. Uh, the days were short sometimes. It used to rain a lot. It used to snow a lot. There were no communications. It was, it, it was not an easy life. And in that kind of thing, sometimes it's easiest just to abdicate your rationality and just inhabit a para world. Yeah. And of course, we have, you talked about alcoholism, but you got to remember there's a lot of smoking up also right. happening there. Absolutely. It's, it's the mother country of cannabis. hemp and cannabis. Cannabis, yes, absolutely. But it is a portrait of another world. As you say, it's a geographically a very enclosed place. 
Um, and the community itself is very um, uh, inter incestuous. So in that sense, you know, I always uh, felt about a novel that it should create a parallel world where that world is complete in itself in a self-referential way. Something like the um, uh, Superman's city of Krypton. Right. So in that sense, this novel and all the three novels about Kumau, they are complete in themselves because they refer to no other world. They refer to a small, self-referential, incestuous, odd, eccentric, but within that, the human stories. Right, you know, I'm, the portrait that these two women are drawing takes me back to the tortured but brilliant, brilliant world of the Brontes. They also lived a completely isolated life in a remote outpost. And yet, out of that family came from flights of fancy and imagination, some of the greatest literature in, in English language, talking of your mother, your mother, many, so, many brilliant women. So talking of the Brontes, in case I forget. Yes, uh, my mother will remember that one of her brothers was from the beginning known as Heathcliff. Really? <laughs> he was. He was called Heathcliff. Heathcliff Agar, because he was, uh, yeah, the demonic. Right. So it was this inner world that really released itself in this extraordinary torrent of of letters. There's one uh, one other factor which is hinted at in Namita's novel, uh, and that is that most people who were literate and uh, formed the kind of upper crust of the society were twice exiled. They had left their places of their origin, come to this little mountain place, and then when the British arrived, the British displaced them further and grabbed the better places for themselves. Nanital was one example. The locals would not take the British to Nanital because they knew if they saw it, they would colonize it. But they managed to go there. They got a boat from Bareilly and the rest is discussed in her book. This, this feeling of being exiled again and again also creates a certain mindset which makes you philosophical, which makes you vague and somewhat woolly-headed. I think the word is cerebral. But for the women, there's another, you know, a lot of the stories in this book came from a book called Mountain Echoes, which had the oral histories of four Komauni women, including my grandmother, her mother, and uh, ma two of my aunts. And uh, what struck me in these stories was that what made these women so modern and intelligent was two factors. One is that the Brahmins had a very strange code of food purity. So these women, until they were married, they did not have a gotra. They were not, therefore, pure or fit enough to go to the kitchen and cook. So unmarried women were not allowed to cook in Kumau. In fact, when my uh, sister got married, my father very proudly told uh, my son, my brother-in-law, he said, Hamare ghar mein khana nahi banati. <laughs> he said, Aap ke mein kya karti hai, But so they were not allowed to cook and they couldn't really go out and have a very good time because uh, they were restrained in all ways and it was snowing or raining. So they would sit in the back rows while their brothers studied. So many of these women by default uh, just listened in to the tutors their brothers always had and had a degree of erudition and uh, uh, education unknown to women across the rest of India, quite by accident. Right. So there was a great deal talking of discrimination uh, against women. You would expect that in any uh, early or enclosed society. But what about caste discrimination? Especially considering that you were upper caste, it's a Brahmin society. When I was growing up, but even as I went to higher classes in school, it broke down primarily because the men in the family migrated to government jobs in the plains right. and many of them took their families with them for elderly women to maintain very large kitchens and kosher rules of cooking for a very long time became very difficult. So my grandmother, for example, who had a very, very strict um, kitchen, 
uh, which it would function just so, in which we all had definite places and we could not touch the cook. The cook would ladle the food on our platters, but we, the uh, ladles must not touch our platters. Nobody could speak while eating and the women in the family would cook wearing one sari. Either it was a bulid sari or a silk sari and it was called bhat pakane ki dhoti. So um, the rules were very strict. But as my uncles migrated and the daughters were married away, my grandmother towards the end of her life uh, was quite uh, by herself and so it was impossible and also with increasing age and stiffness in limbs and so on, she herself broke a lot of rules uh, that she had established. So it was interesting in some ways also a little sad to see this happening but I think it set women free in a very big way because it was sheer torture in the hill winters to cook early in the morning, first of all, for at least a dozen school years, school going children, and then for men who had to start their day at 10. And then last of all, the daughters-in-law and the mother-in-law would sit in the kitchen and eat. And the, you know, so health uh, was affected. What are the other hierarchies of caste that were practiced? Uh, you know, I grew up feeling privileged and entitled and feeling as though there was something intrinsically about being a Brahmin that was good. And my grandfather used to read Tennyson and say, me, the heir of ages, foremost in the ranks of time and things. There was a huge, huge, huge sense of entitlement among this very pure, com very, very poor community. They had nothing to be proud of except Hamari Nak, their fake sort of pride on that and their heritage in their caste heritage and sometimes the only wealth they had was a nibu ka pair with some nibus hanging outside. So there was, it was a compensatory pride but the rest of the caste system as I know in Kumau was not as savage then. It has become more savage over the years but in my memory it was uh, strictly compartmentalized but not as cruel. That cruelty came in later with the jealousies of the upper classes when they began to lose privilege. They got bitter. I'd like to go back to the intellectual gene, the cerebral gene of, of Kamani Brahmins. Um, considering the example of Shivani, one of the most prolific, wide-ranging, widely lo loved writers uh, of Uttar Pradesh and North India, your remarkable mother and her memory and her ability to express yourself, both of you. Uh, where does this come from? Do you think it's passed on? Is it the result of an inner life, uh, considering that so much is written from mind and memory, a combination of both? Start with Shivani, your mother. Well, my mother was specially lucky. Her grandfather was a very close friend of Madan Mohan Malviya, who in those days was all for promoting women's education. So he told his friend, you must send your children out to a boarding school, including your two eldest granddaughters, so that they can get a well-rounded education. The grandfather, who was the head of Sanskrit department in Banaras University, in those days, it was uh, Sanskrit Vishwavidyalaya. He had objections because he said Ki, they will lose their values and they'll become very westernized. So he said, no, my other friend Tagore has just started Guru Palli in Shantaniketan and I vouch that your children will never lose their roots and they will be brought up in a proper educational stream and their minds will be freed. So there was a liberal streak, so a forward looking. So there was looking. this liberal streak. So my mother and uh, her older sister, Pushpesh's mother, and a brother, uh, all three of them were sent, but alongside the grandfather sent a cook so that he would, he negotiated with Tagore and said that he would send his children conditional to the cook being allowed to cook kosher meals for his grandchildren. So Tagore being Tagore readily agreed and he said, I want children from all corners of India, let them come to me. They will stay with me the first year and learn the language. 
let the cook take care of the cooking, I don't mind. So this cook, um, uh, we used to call him Thul Lohaniju, the big Lohaniji, was sent with them. Lohaniji went there and then of course he said, Mujhe Bangal ka paani achha nahi lagta hai, mujhe machli ki baas aati hai. You know, he said, it reeks of fish and I don't like Bengal and all that. So my uncle who was quite wicked, spun a story for him and he wrote to his uh, uncles, uh, to his grandfather saying that a woman has cast a spell Bangale ka jadu kar diya hai bade lohani ji par aur wo mask khane lage hai so SOS came from home saying send lohani home so lohani ji was repatriated and all these three children became big carnivores and lived happily ever so after in the body. So can I interrupt at that stage you know in this book called Mountain Echoes which has the oral biographies of these four Kumaoni women, um, Shivani uh, has spoken a lot about Lohani ji. And I loved her description so much that I just picked it up, you could say appropriated, plagiarized, but I was careful about it. And in this novel, The Book of Shadows, one of the main characters is Lohani ji who tells these stories and uh, it's just wonderful how all our stories between us remain uh, in a seamless space. They exist, I mean her stories exist in me, my cousin Pushpesh is sitting in the audience, his stories stay within us, we, we, we share them instinctively. Lohani ji was a um, cook come spy for the grandfather who was very strict and he felt that his son was too anglicized and his daughter-in-law was too loyal to her husband. So he wanted an eye kept out for any floutings of the strict norms. So Thul Lohaniju was always in attendance uh, on my grandfather and my grandmother and he fetched and carried for them. Then my fa grandfather, who was then the principal of uh, Princess College in Rajkot, would come home uh, to the hills in the holidays and Lohaneju would attend to everything. And uh, he was great friends with Jim Corbett. So Jim Corbett and his sister uh, visited him once and there was an English kitchen in the house outside in which an English tea was prepared under supervision of Lohaneji. And as a great concession to the great hunter, because everybody loved Jim Corbett so much. He said, Carpet sahab ko chai pila ke aata hun. So he went and took the tea things and served it to Jim Corbett and his sister. His sister had, my mother writes in her autobiography, uh, an unfortunate tick in her eye. So it seemed that she was winking all the time. So he banged the tray and my grandfather couldn't say anything and he came back and he came back to my uh, great grandfather where my yeah, grandmother was sitting and she said, I will tell you now that the meme is not good, it's not good, Lala sahab is eating my eyes. That white woman is a threat to your daughter-in-law, she's winking at your son, let me inform you. But here I want to just come in and say that it was not only women writers, we were fortunate to have so many great uh, male writers. There is uh, Sumitra Nandan Pant, the very, very great poet who is among our gene pool. There is also, uh, <clears throat> I keep saying Murli Manohar Shyam Joshi, one of the greatest writers in Hindi ever and the person who uh, did so much in television and television serials and who has been translated by Mrinal's sister. So, uh, so many others, uh, Tara Pandey. And so, there was a by some freak accident in this small community, I don't think it's there freak. was a huge number of writers. There is my cousin Pushpesh sitting in the audience. There, right. there are just so many people in Kumau who, who write well. I mean, lots of people write, but right. they write I well. Mean, I'm, particularly, I'm particularly pleased, in fact, very thrilled that uh, with your stories of Lahaniji, the cook, and cuisine, uh, which forms a very important part, and both of you reference your cousin Pushpesh Pant, who's here, who many in the world know as uh, a great professor of politics, but his passion is, of course, cooking. Uh, the best, the best book, according to me, on Indian recipes, collated over decades from every corner of India, every corner, is by Pushpesh Pant, the ultimate directory on food. And 
it shows you the way life comes together whether it's politics whether it's food whether it's feminism as in the life of shivani industriousness the sheer labor the prolific output was it almost for both of you a habit to write and write continuously i mean both of you run proper big time professional careers there are so many people sitting here from the jaipur festival they they love writing they love reading once it enters your blood you know it's it's uh, the way some people get into exercise mode and unless they've gone they get that endomorphic rush so i also find that unless i write with some sort of irregular consistency i start feeling ill and when i write i get that intensity back in my life and i guess we all are obsessed by creating our own lives and our own stories um, where uh, our own unreality is more real than your reality vinal up is it obs I obsessive for you as it was for your mother look at her output uh, yes so obsessive i remember obsessed. that yeah. i mean she wrote three weekly columns she produced endless books short stories laboring every day yeah. what was it like to grow up in that atmosphere i i guess we just took it for granted and when we came back from school we demanded a tea like all children and my mother would produce this enormous loaf of bread and a huge pot of homemade jam and we'd polish it off it never struck us that we didn't have a hot tea waiting for us or whatever in the morning she would slap up some kind of a lunch for us and we would never complain about it the only good thing was that my mother by the time we were in college was so well known that we were kind of satellite celebrities in the university basking in reflected basking glory basking in reflected glory and we made an inordinate number of friends who would ask us to reveal to them the end of a particular novel that was being serialized at that time and seniors stopped ragging us because we told them if they rag us then we would not tell them the plot in in one particular case the serialized novel seemed to be headed for a sad ending and when we went home for holidays the the both of us sisters we were made to swear on a geeta that we would talk to our mother about making it a happy ending even if she was planning to make it a sad ending the novel was chauda phere so finally there was a kahani mein twist dala gaya sahab zabardast in my mother was furious with us and then the next time we went home she showed us a bunch of letters from furious readers who said that we were it was heading for something and then you made it too filmy and you gave it a happy ending and we are very angry with you it's not like you to write like this my mother said tum choriyo na karwaya mujhse did you inherit that habit yes Yes, I am very bossy. I am a bully as a mother. I mean, how di the discipline of writing? Okay. Never mind your bossiness. <laughs> well, you have to be bossy if you are a woman and a housewife and a mother, and you want to write. You have to tell everybody, just get out of my room, get out of my hair, and write wherever it, you have time and whenever you have time. So you kind of discipline and make. yourself steal it yourself into a role maybe you are not like many other mothers maybe your children resent it later and you know it comes out some ways but you just don't care when you are writing for me it was not only writing when i wanted how i wanted it was writing what i wanted because my very first novel threw me into this strange area at a very young age at a very young age i wrote it when i was 26 uh, and it was published when i was 27 and india was much more conservative at that time i remember my father asked me i has he said i hope you've been discreet <laughs> so i said well, i hope so but of course it was not a discreet novel it was a very very frank novel and since then regularly whenever i've written a book i've got into trouble some way or the other and i'm glad to say that the things to leave behind my new novel seems to have met with more uh, affection and less consternation than the others consternation isn't the word the word actually is controversy namita and i go back a very long way and when this book that she's talking about it was called paro dreams of passion when it appeared i think you were in your early 20s 
it really caused an absolute sensation. Shobade is a rather poor imitation and patch. Paro Dreams of Fashion was steamy, powerful, and well talked about. And at, in your early 20s, what was it like to suddenly have this international acclaim? After all, you were also a young mother. I think I was fortunate that uh, my family and my husband's family took it in their stride. I very strategically dedicated it to my mother-in-law, so then she took it in her stride. But um, I remember Shivani, uh, your mother, coming to me and saying, don't be afraid, just go ahead, don't be afraid of what people say. And then I remember you rung me up once and you said, I respect your spunk in writing this book. So. To be a woman and to be a writer, as Shivani did, as you did, as all of us do, when we come from a very conservative background, it takes a little bit of extra strength. Though, of course, you don't think we come from a conservative background after all the silly stories we've been telling. But at the same time, it takes strength to say it as it is and not to make it pretty and feminine. Do you, do you think we should open it up? But so I. I urge all of you women writers in the audience, and I can see many of them here, um, young girls who are writing for the first time, the, I'd say the rule is don't be afraid. That's all, just don't be afraid of what other people think or what you yourself think of yourself. Don't self-censor, just have fun. Have fun and be fearless. That is the way it plays for these two amazing kissing, but not kicking Kumani cousins. We'll now uh, take a few select audiences from the question. Large number of hands coming up, and Namita, you are right. They're all from women. First, this young lady in the green jersey. Thank you, ma'am and ma'am, for uh, a wonderful session. My question. Uh, is basically born just out of curiosity. Uh, you uh, gave us a lovely trajectory of uh, this world that uh, you belong to in the hills, which was quite inward looking. Uh, I want to ask that uh, what happened once you step up, stepped out from the hills to the plains to the, uh, let's say, from the hills to the city, uh, was it uh, easy to go back uh, in the sense that uh, were you able to sort of uh, was there an instinct to uh, then judge the community from, a, you know, from a conventional sort of uh, city-bred perspective, or did it did the movement, you know, give you that uh, critical distance which was required to sort of uh, put it on paper? I can speak for myself, and then Ira can. Um, I mean, sorry, Rinal can. I never left it behind. I never ever left it behind. In my head, I'm still living in Nainital, and. Uh, uh, wherever else I live, I love those places, but it, a part of me never went away and I know so it is with all the others because we love the beauty of that place so intensely. I left uh, the hills when I went to college and the first thing it struck me was the heat and the dust. I just couldn't take it and I told my mother I can't take the heat and dust and she said stop talking like a white woman. You are a pahadi, you can take everything. <laughs> you should be thankful that I have arranged for enough money to, for you to get a good education. And I never complained after that. But I still remember in the hostel during March months when the heat started building up, I used to pour buckets of water in my room, sit with my feet resting on the water and then read. Otherwise, I just could not think it was so hot. And of course, summers we went away and spent with our parents in the hills. So we kept coming and going and unlike Namita, I married into another eccentric Kumauni family. Mine was an arranged marriage. So I had two homes, my mother's house, my grandmother's house and my father's house. And then when I got married, I also had my father-in-law's house. And after he retired, my father-in-law and mother-in-law chose to go back to the hills, live in Almora. So we used to visit them all the time. So I was in touch. I've never felt judgmental about the hills, but it breaks my heart that once again, the land in Uttarakhand is being taken away from people who 
speak the language who belong to it, and being parceled out for very high prices. Little nolas and gadheras and little plots of land are going for enormous sums, we are told, and people are selling ancestral properties because they can no longer be bothered about going. So the next time you go, you see an outlandish Khanna hotel or a you know, Falana Villa with an outlandish plains name. So you know that one more part of your childhood is gone. And that hurts. I am still very, very attached to the region I grew up in. You know, we've completely run out of time. Uh, Mrinal Pandey has put it so beautifully.